You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. What's really interesting is if you think about financial independence as really the opportunity to design your future, to design this life that you want to live into, it actually starts to pose some significant challenges because you realize like you have your entire future ahead of you. What do you want it to be? What if you want to be location independent? What if you don't want to kick that down until you're 65? What are the practicalities of traveling the world, walking away from potentially, I don't know, median income, high income jobs and taking this on? I think today in this episode, we're going to get a chance to explore that idea, that concept with two individuals, Mr. and Mrs. Nomad, who actually write over at nomadnumbers.com. They've been doing this for the last 18 months, and they've been documenting their story. They've been documenting their cost of living, the challenges that come with community, the challenges that come with filling their time with meaningful ideas and projects and doing this in a really wonderful wrapper. And they're going to be able to present this idea to our audience and give us just a sense of what it would look like to take this on, not just in your golden years. Not just from a cruise ship where you kind of go throughout or you quickly hit three or four destination spots, spending as much as possible, but to slow travel through a really, really big world. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing quite well. And yeah, as you're describing this, it's the paradox of choice writ large, right? Both with travel, as Mr. and Mrs. Nomad are doing, but just with FI generally. We have time, we have resources, and what are we going to do with it? And I think that's a really interesting question. I think they can dive into both aspects of that. So with that, Mr. and Mrs. Nomad, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. to be here. Oh, Mr. Nomad is my father. You can call me Norm. (laughs) 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 All right. Really? I, I will not give you a courtesy lap for that. <laughs> I <had to> get, <laughs> Zero I thought was, courtesy lap. it was good. Someone <laughs> called you Mr. Barrett recently and I about oh, fell over. It was weird. Yeah, that definitely was Mr. Weird. Barrett is my father. <laughs> I thought I would play. I had to take a stab. <laughs> All right. I'm really excited about your story and excited about what you pulled off. But I want to go back and say that, you know, as two individuals, you're tackling financial independence and traveling the world in your mid-30s. And I imagine that when you decided to walk away from your fairly lucrative jobs, your parents and friends kind of looked at you like, well, you've made a pretty serious financial mistake. That's not going to work out for you. And I'm just curious, like if you were to go back to your origin story and how you approach being a, a digital nomad effectively, what was the inception for that idea? Well, we weren't digital nomads to start. We were working conventional jobs, going into the office, Commuting, actually, I mean, in Silicon Valley, it's quite common for people to live in San Francisco and then commute one and a half hours each way to their job. So we we were doing that for quite some time. As a transition period, I did become a digital nomad in that I joined a remote company where I was able to work from anywhere around the world because there were no offices. So we were able to do that. And that was sort of a nice transition period from going into the office to being a digital nomad to then just being a nomad without the work part. And it was tough. We didn't quite know what to tell our friends and family. I mean, I think you didn't even really tell yeah, your family. For me, because I grew up in France, you might you might be able to get that with my accent. But so I've moved to the U.S. in 2008, so 10 years ago. And so my parents were like, oh, yeah, 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 you should do it. You should do it. But like internally, my mom was like, oh, my God, my son is like 8,000 miles away from me. No, I'm just seeing him once a year if he can take that much vacation. So knowing that now I, we can reclaim the time back for what we are doing right now and spending more time with them, which is actually one of our uh, value that we wanted to put forward with that financial independence has been pretty good. So did you two each separately follow the path to FI and saving money and such predating when you met? Or was this something that was supercharged after you guys met? Just kind of place us in time. Yeah, so it was 
supercharged after we met. We didn't discover Phi until after we met, but we were individually both earning high salaries and both naturally frugal. So we were, without knowing about Phi, saving over 50% of our salaries, but thinking we were saving it in order to buy a house or in order to buy all the things you think you need. Trying to afford something in San Francisco, which is like totally insane. Yeah. So we're just parking the money there instead of just what are we going to do with it? Yeah. And we weren't investing very optimally or very smart. I mean, we weren't diversified at all. We were picking individual stocks. So we were doing everything wrong. And we didn't know until we stumbled upon Phi because actually we were researching ways that we could make a dream of ours come true, which was to travel long term. Initially, I thought it'd be fun to travel for one year. And then Mr. Nomad said, why one year? Why not definitely yeah. longer? Because again, grew up in France, I think the relationship to travel and the cost was much lower than in high cost of living like California. So for me, that notion seems to be much more doable than from yeah. my, wife, my wife's perspective. Yeah, I thought it was crazy. I didn't think it was possible. But then I started, started doing some research and seeing how other people do it. And so in my search, I literally did a search for podcasts with the term perpetual travel. And the first result that came up was a mad scientist podcast episode where he mm -hmm. interviews the retire early lifestyle couple who are doing perpetual travel. And then as we were listening to that episode, we were kind of confused throughout the whole thing. We were like, what are they saying they retired in their 30s through investments? I'm kind of confused how they're able to do this. And that just brought us down the rabbit hole of understanding what five was, reading all the blogs, listening to all the podcasts. We were doing this research around end of 2017, which was the same time that you guys came out with the Choose FI podcast. So it was actually really good timing because we were hungry for content and there wasn't a whole lot of content out there. We felt like we had read everything mm -hmm. and listened to all the podcasts yeah. and we're like, we want more. There's not that much more. And then, is that, yeah, we and then you guys came out. out and we're like coming out with episodes twice per week. So that was awesome. That'll fill an hour and a half commute for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, well, actually, I want to go back to that. So I listened to that episode that you're referring to several years ago. And I think it's, is it Billy and Akisha? Is, did I get the name right, right there? All right. So yeah. in that Good episode, memory. thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe, as you said, they retired in their early 30s. And I believe they did it with a net worth of around $500,000. They somehow yeah. survived the 2008 you know, market crash on that nest egg that they put aside and were able, as you stated, to perpetually travel for their, you know, the next 10 plus years and are still traveling. And I think their, their home base was Aruba. I'm curious if that was the Vanguard, if that was the pilot for what you looked at and said, wow, somebody pulled it off. Maybe we could do it. And I think you guys share a lot of your numbers. What were the numbers that you were comparing with to make you feel comfortable, you know, walking away from your jobs and pulling this off? Well, we weren't exactly sure what the numbers would be at first, because when, like you said, the 500,000 sounded really low to us when we first heard that. We were like, oh, can you really travel the world indefinitely on 500,000? So it wasn't until we started getting really educating ourselves on the finances, like reading um, The Simple Path to Wealth by Jim Collins and his blog. That was when we learned about all those investing rules and the 25x rule about saving 25x your annual expense, that's when it became really clear for us. So we're like, okay, that makes sense to us. That is a number we can calculate and get behind. And that's where we felt comfortable. Like we had that. So, yeah. we, so we mapped our nest eggs and we say, oh, this is how much we can spend. Yeah. That seems to be plenty, definitely more than what they had. And uh, so, yeah, we start running with that. I think in our mind, we say, okay, let's use 40,000 as kind of our annual expenses. So we're starting rolling with that number. Um, yeah, because that's what we believed we could travel around the world for on a budget of 40K and stay within the 4% withdrawal rule. Yeah. So I know, Mrs. Nomad, you kind of uh, self-deprecatingly said you were doing everything wrong, right? But <laughs> you were saving 50% of your money already. So clearly you weren't doing everything wrong. But I I'm curious, what did you change in your lives when this supercharged to FI path opened up for you, right? So you read Simple Path to Wealth. I assume something changed with your investing style, but talk us through some major changes you made after finding the concept of fine. Yeah. So once we learned about the importance of having, 
I don't know. Reducing risk exposure. Yeah, reducing one. risk exposure because we were we had a really high risk investment portfolio in that we basically had individual stocks from the past tech companies that we worked at. And that probably made up a scary percentage. I want to say like 75 to 80 percent of our portfolio. Yeah. <laughs> it was really scary. So basically, you, you work on those tech companies. They give you those preferential shares that yeah. you say, oh, yeah, that's a good benefit. You take them in your uh, TD Ameritrade account and then you never look at them. And six years down the line, it's like, whoa, I have that huge portfolio. And it's like individual stock, which is whatever company you work on, yeah. which I think was three for me, two for you. Uh, it was a very unintentional way of investing. It just happened yeah. to be we were getting these stocks from the company. We didn't do anything with it. We let it sit. Um, and we got lucky because it was like 2008. Fortunately, the tech industry did well. But when we learned about how to properly invest and to mitigate risk, we're like, this is a really bad idea. This is really <laughs> risky. <laughs> so we sold everything pretty much. Yeah. Well, we, we held on to some things for tax reasons, but we pretty much sold everything and moved everything to index funds. The low cost index funds. Low cost index funds. The VTSAX and the VTI yeah. and some of the bonds. And the bonds. So that's what we did. And then we we also, to add a little bit of diversification, we went into real estate for a small percentage, but we got out of the individual stocks right away. So now actionable tip wise, what does that look like practically? I think there are many people listening to this who are in the same boat, right? They have been investing, I guess, whatever, suboptimally or whatever you want to call it, differently than they want to now with new information. And yet they have built in unrealized capital gains. They have significant tax issues if they just wholesale sold everything, which it sounds like you guys may have done to some degree. Like, how did you think through that? Were there significant unrealized cap gains in there? Like, talk me through the actual process of that. Yeah, so we were like, we have, we are sitting on all of that money, but it's really, really like right now unstable in the sense that it has been growing for the past 10 years. The market was like supposed to turn over, like that was 2017. Yeah, so we decided to really sell everything at once. We did pay capital gain, actually, but we felt okay with that because we said, okay, now we are diversifying. So we didn't want it to wait a few years to do that, that exercise. So yeah, we paid cap gains upfront. They were long-term capital gains, so it was not too bad. But um, one of the options would have been we could have spread it out over two years if we were okay to take that risk, if we were confident in the following year that there wouldn't be a downturn. But we didn't want to take that risk because we were pretty close to pulling the plug and quitting our jobs. We didn't want to take that risk of having all this money locked up uh, on individual stocks. So we pretty much took the capital gain hit right away. That's really interesting. I mean, just, just to kind of, and I don't know what companies you work for. I'm not even asking in the context, of this, but I'm just saying like from the perspective of maybe someone's listening to this, they work for a giant tech company right now. That tech company was just valued at $46 billion. And they're like, whoa, this is amazing. And then like, no, you're not a tech company. You're a real estate company. You're worth less than $6 billion. Oh, oh, well, that's not good, right? So in terms of like paying capital gains, what are we going to do? You know, you could spread it out, but you have so much risk, so much risk when you're all in one company and it's all based on evaluation, based on what, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. The ability to, even if you had to pay capital gains, you're paying tax on the appreciated money. So while in a perfect world, when you're perfectly diversified and you own all the companies, you're like, well, hey, we can, we can minimize the capital gains we pay by understanding how the tax codes work and spreading out how much we're taking at any given time. When you have the level of risk that you have when you're potentially, again, potentially working for one of these unicorn-esque companies, pay the capital gains. Get it diversified. You just don't know the future is uncertain and you may not be able to tolerate yeah, yeah. that level and, of risk. And since we started getting accumulating those shares in like for me 2008, one of that company I was working with like was not doing very well when everybody else was doing well. So it's like, oh, I was making a ton of money. And then every month there was a big swing of like, I don't know, within, I think there was a year when there were swings of $100,000 within an entire year of like just the stock changing because of the valuation. So it was like, wow, waiting for me, like as uh, my wife was saying to try to reduce the capital gain was not worth the risk, especially because we knew that we have enough to start being financially free. So we say, let's take that tax. We know exactly what we are losing, but at least we get the guarantee that the rest should be, should be good and solid. Yeah. And the part here that would transfer over to someone, even not in a tech company, where we're talking about this massive appreciation. A lot of individuals, almost everyone listening to this that works for a larger corporation has access to employee stock purchase plans. 
where their company will give them company stock at a discount in order to get them investing. And if that happens to be the case for you as an individual, as a listener listening to this, like take the discount, get the company stock. But as soon as you are outside of whatever restriction window they have on this, like do what you got to do to get that money into a more diversified option. And, and I just think that's probably a good actual tip for an audience at large. There's so much risk in having not only your job, your W-2 income tied up in a company, but also your entire financial future as well. Exactly. That's what we wish we did early on. So now going back to preparing for this travel, you said $40,000 was the number that you had in your mind as, all right, this is what we're going to work off of. So I'm assuming, though I, that's generally a, a bad idea, that the 4% rule is in effect. So you're thinking a million dollars net worth. Can you talk me through if that's an accurate assumption? And then like, how do you start preparing your finances for this actual travel? Were there any changes? So in order to be prepared for if there were a down year, we wanted to make sure we had enough cash to not pull out of our principal. So that's something we did. So we wanted to make sure we had at least two years of travel expenses in cash. So for us, that would be 80000 So that if we were traveling during a down year, that we would have the cash to spend versus selling any stocks at a loss. But the other thing we're not too worried about with that is that we have the advantage of geo arbitrage. So we plan on in down years, if we don't want to pull out of our principal, to spend more time in lower cost countries. So we plan on spending more time in Southeast Asia and Central and South America, which are places we love to spend time in anyways. So that's our plan. And then on years that we're confident, we can spend more time in higher cost countries like Europe and and North America, which we have been doing this past year and a half or so. So other than that, I think those are the main things. Other than that, we're trying to keep our investment strategy the same. Well, once we started reverting to low cost index funds and we started the real estate path to diversify because we felt like it was even though diversifying in stock market, it was everything in the stock market and we don't know what's going to happen next. So we felt like moving to real estate would be interesting. I started experimenting with real estate in France because that was some of the things that my parents were teaching me to do is like, you know, you invest into like a home and that's not going to go anywhere over time. People still need places to live, even though the investment in France were not as uh, lucrative as the one we did after in the U.S., that was also something we felt comfortable doing. And so we diversify that way as well. So I think that's, I think that's what we do on the financial side. Perfect. Now, I actually have a question for you because you guys are living in a pretty high cost of living area, San Francisco. It sounded to me like you were saying your cost of living actually even in San Francisco is only around $50,000 a year. Was that accurate? How much did your life cost in San Francisco? Yeah, so 60000 a year. And that was actually below the average. Uh, I think the average in San Francisco is 80,000 a year. Yeah, so 60,000 for us. And then in our first year of travel, even though we planned for 40,000, we ended up only spending 28,000 on that first year. So we are way below. And we that's why we're also now comfortable that just to get to the 40,000, we'll have to have a good lifestyle. So cost of travel, I think this is kind of where I want to spend a little bit of time for our audience, because I think if you're going to be a nomad, and you're saying, hey, we can go anywhere. What do we, where do we want to go? How much do we want our life to cost? A lot of you telling us how much it actually cost was the planning that you put in before you left. So someone's saying, well, I'm not ready to travel yet. Great. Let's spend some time planning it out, right? You can go anywhere. Let's spend some time planning it out. So I'm just curious, because you're saying this is actually what it cost. How much of that did you feel confident about going into it? And how did you break down those expenses? Because it sounds like you nailed this. I mean, $28,000 for that first year, like how did you map that out and where did that money go? So actually, I've, so for the story, since I have my first uh, euro in France, actually it was franc before it become euros, but I was tracking all of my expenses. So for me, tracking expense was kind of second nature, uh, maybe a little bit like Brad liked to do. So when we get into that travel, I was the person taking tab of everything. So every time we go out, we just like record everything. And then I starting building spreadsheets initially. And every month we review our budget, uh, which then turned out to building my own tools around that. But the idea was like, yeah, so we could easily get into every single expense. So for our first year, um, yeah, that's all we ended up to that number of 28,000, which was roughly um, 
I can get into the specific category per category if you guys are interested. Yeah, I think so. But let's put some guardrails around that. So um, if an individual wants to, you know, be able to spend a year living abroad through the process of slow travel, what are the, you know, those big items that they need to consider that would keep the cost of that year of travel below $30,000? Is the primary one, what is the location that you're going to? I mean, how do you work through that priority chart? So I think accommodation has been by far for us the biggest spending. I think it's like a third of our budget has been through uh, accommodation. So you will look into the specific location. We have been, though, in places that you might think are expensive, but we have been applying some strategies. So, for instance, we like to stay in places uh, for at least four to six weeks. So that also is giving us pretty big discounts. Um, if you talk about accommodation, for instance, we basically use Airbnb everywhere we go and we get a um, substantial discount up to 50% just by wow. getting those four weeks uh, rental. Um, so that has been helping us, keeping us the cost down. And just to give you some numbers there, we went to Aruba, which is that nice paradisiac island that people usually go on their honeymoon or for a special occasion. And they will spend two or 3,000 just for that week because it's very special and, and very touristy. We spend less than 3,000. We actually spend 2,700 for four weeks there. And we were just like five minutes uh, from the beach, which has been one of the most relaxing locations. So yeah, I think the long-term stay is also something to look into. Um, to We've also been able to negotiate on top of that. I was going to ask you, I mean, I, I would imagine you go to Airbnb and you put in four to six weeks, you get a price, right? Like how are you <laughs> able to get it for 2,000? Yeah, so the host typically put a discount, a weekly discount, as well as a monthly discount. And we've seen up to uh, between 25% and 40% discounts for monthly stays. And then on top of that, if you notice that maybe they don't have a lot of bookings or maybe there's a lot of competition in that space, sometimes if you message them directly and say, hey, I noticed you're offering a 25% discount for a month stay, We'd be interested in staying for five or six weeks. Do you think you can give us a 30 or 40% discount? And oftentimes they're willing to give us maybe not exactly what we're asking for, but we're able to negotiate. A good and get compromise. A, yeah, yeah. Because for them, discount. also, if you put yourself in their shoe, they are trying to get as little vacancy as possible. If they are struggling to get people just like for a week and then they have cleaning fees and logistics, uh, having someone securely booked uh, will give them some peace of mind. So we've been able to pull that trigger for sure. So, right, you said negotiate and also long-term stays, right? So those are two great tips. I wonder, are there any other items as far as like specific locations? I know you said Aruba, right? We all think of Aruba as an expensive place, but yet you were able to do it fairly inexpensively. But when you're mapping out your future travel, do you think in terms of cost and location or is it just, hey, we want to go to this place and we'll figure something out? I'd love to hear how you conceptualize that. Yeah, in general, we try to balance high cost living countries with low cost. So, you know, our first year of travel, we had a balance of high cost countries like Canada, Aruba, we spent some time in France and the US. But then we also balanced it with staying for three months in Mexico. And now currently we're in Southeast Asia for six months or so. So it all balances out in, in the end by doing that. And it keeps things interesting, too, because then we get to experience different cultures and different ways of life. But, yeah, we are intentionally balancing high cost and low cost living countries. And like I mentioned previously, that also gives us the flexibility when we want to dial down our costs for years where we want to be more conservative to spend more time in low cost countries. And then years where we're more confident, we will feel comfortable spending more time in high costs. Yeah, year two, for instance, we were in Europe, so we spent uh, one month in Porto, one month in Lisbon uh, during the high season, which is like the worst time in Europe to be because everybody like shut down everything and just go on vacation during July, August. So we went there and then so the, the accommodation cost and those two months were the most expensive we had, way more expensive actually than Aruba. And so when we said, okay, so then when are we going to go next? We wanted to do Southeast Asia. So we stopped by Eastern Europe. Uh, we went to Montenegro for a month, which was drastically cheaper. And now we have been in Southeast Asia for four months. I think we plan to be there for uh, two more months, for a total of six months. And in those countries, it's, it's difficult to spend more than 2,000 a month. So by just adding those pieces, I know like Southeast Asia will be 2,000 a month, Europe maybe 3,000, then we can easily plug and play our uh, budget for the year. 
I would imagine transportation can be a significant cost, right? Traveling between countries, traveling between cities. How are you budgeting for that? How are you saving money? How are you thinking about transportation to and from places? So when it comes to international transportation, we are actually with Discover Travel Rewards, thanks to you guys, that's episode nine that I've been listening uh, so many times once we um, mm-hmm. knew it. So um, yeah, we've been using Travel Rewards a lot. On that first year, we spent, so I think we did 11 locations among five countries. So you can imagine that's a few uh, international flights in there. For we, two people. For two people. We pay out of pocket 1500 Everything else was travel rewards. So that was our entire international travel budget for a, a full year of travel around the world. So yeah, we did score some pretty good deal with the, the rewards. I was going to say, that's actually the amazing thing. I think a lot of people think like it's going to be the cost of travel that's going to break this entire thing. It barely is a rounding error on your on your annual budget once you understand the power of travel rewards. That's the crazy part of a lot of this. And it's almost like it's so definable that like we don't even need to spend a ton of time here. If you're worried that travel is going to break the bank and you can't travel the world because the cost of travel is too much, just stop. Just stop. Go listen to episode nine. Just a travel course. Just take the travel course. You're going to be good to go. Now let's focus on the things that Really, you need to know in order to pull off successful nomadism. Yeah, well, there is a hack in there in that because we are nomadic, we didn't have a physical address. So when we sign up to those cards, it's like, where are those cards going? We don't have anyone that can receive them for them. So we sign up for those uh, mailing address. And then those people over there can just scan the card for us. And we use them mostly the big expense. If you go, for instance, in Southeast Asia, are just like accommodation and all of those that you do online. For all of the expense here, we use cash. So yeah, so we just get those cards scanned in and we can just use them without even having the card physically. So that's kind of the little twist we added on top of the travel rewards nice. that we've been using. No, that's a great point. Actually, that brings me to a whole other thing I wanted to talk about because if you're a part-time nomad, you could say, oh, we got a home base. It'll be there when we get back. Hey, would you mind checking the mail for us? You know, that sort of thing. If you're a full-time nomad, that goes out the window. You no longer have a home base. And we just talked about the mail. We'll, we'll come back to that. That's a great point. But actually, the larger point is you have no place for your stuff. You have 30 years of stuff, and now you have no place for it. You're going to be traveling around the world full time. And I mean, as you as full time travelers know, like the suitcase scenario is serious. So I'm just curious as two individuals that pulled this off. What do you take? What makes the cut? (laughs) Well, actually, there is an additional uh, plane that follows us every time we travel (laughs) with all of our stuff. So we have uh, home and everything. (laughs) Uh, no, that was too expensive. And unfortunately, even though we did say we did not have enough for that. So yeah. we have to <laughs> choose the, the path of the downsizing. So we never own a home. So we were both, um, I was in San Francisco in an apartment for like 10 years. So I was like, it was a one bedroom apartment. So it was as much as I could put there. And basically we realized that, I don't know, 90% of that stuff was a uh, uh, I don't know, you have 110 t-shirts from those tech company Schwag. All of the Schwag you can imagine that I thought was, I might choose one day. So yeah, so we basically follow the Marie Kondo book mm-hmm. that you guys, I'm sure, uh, have heard about. And uh, yeah, so we don't size everything, just keep the things that brought us value to our life, which was not a ton, and stuff all of that into two backpack each. And we've... So we travel carry on only. So not only did we get rid of all of our stuff and pare down our belongings, but we managed to do it carry on only. Oh yeah, because we don't want to wait to pick up our luggage and then things get lost. Uh, and Mr. Nomad, I noticed that half of your allowance basically was electronics, which means of the 35 <laughs> total pounds, you've got more than 11 of that just dedicated to your laptop, your iPad, your phone, your charger, which means you have 12 pounds of clothes left over. I mean, how many actual articles of clothing are following you around the world? Well, if you want all of the details, you, you know, you can check it out on the blog because we do take picture of everything because people don't believe us. But it's basically, yeah, you have... Uh, he wears a lot of the same t-shirts. You, you might... I mean, I do uh, as well. I so notice some pictures, yeah. Yeah, 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 that's all like, you need. Yeah, we also... Basically, we need enough for basically a week because as we say, we stay four months in those places. Those are like Airbnbs with like washer and dryer and all of that thing. So uh, as long as we can rotate within a, a week we have good enough. And then we just wear the stuff I love. So every single piece of clothes I have, that's what I really love and they all have some sort of value. Um, yeah, so it doesn't take that much space. And I love electronics too. So it's like, it was a hard balance. Um, actually, in the first year, we started 
way over packing in clothes and stuff and realize, oh, we don't need a ton of that stuff. So we've been on year two, like reducing and just it's it's an ongoing adjustment on what you need. And, and Brad, it's very personal. as I, well. I know you want to hop in here, but just in case, I think I, I think us guys can kind of get easily thrown off in a silo and say, well, you're just a dude. You wear the same boxers and same T-shirt and the same. you've never changed. Like, that's it. That's, but I think a lot of women probably listen to this saying, well, there's so much more. Don't you know? Like, and so Mrs. Nomad, I kind of, for you, what did it look like for you? How did you strategize it? And again, I, I have noticed you guys have two great articles here where you actually lay out everything you brought with you. We'll have both those linked up in the show notes for the episode, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear like your mental thought process. You are working through what you need to bring on this trip around the world where you're staying on the trip around the world. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It, it is a bit more challenging for me and for women in general that like to have more variety and like to wear something else different from tech t-shirts. So one concept that I've adopted and have researched is this concept called capsule wardrobing, which is basically a minimalist approach to having a wardrobe. And you don't necessarily have to travel to have a capsule wardrobe, but it works really well for people that travel just because you're limited on space in general. But the idea is that you have high quality clothing that are limited in number, but you just have like two really good shirts, maybe a couple pants, a dress, a shirt. And then you have a color palette where you make sure that they all match with each other so that you can mix and match, um, and that they are versatile and have multiple purposes. So you can wear a shirt, in multiple ways. Like you can wear, like I have a white blouse that I would wear buttoned over as a blouse or I'd wear it over another shirt. And you basically create different outfits with it. It's not perfect, but it works pretty well. So basically the idea is that you would have like seven to 10 articles of clothing and you should be able to create 35 to 40 different outfits with it by, by mixing and matching. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's actually an amazing concept and a lot of people have it down to a science. I'm not like perfect in it. I have things that are out of the color scheme and things like that. But for people that do it really right, and there's plenty of bloggers and Instagrammers that do, it's quite amazing what they're able to pull off. Yeah, and I'm jealous because I don't have this. I have to carry every single t-shirt I want. <laughs> I cannot put them upside down. It doesn't work. So <laughs> that's right. Oh, that's great. I, I love the concept of you need seven days of clothes. You have a washing machine and a dryer. You don't need seven months worth of clothes. Like so many of us, I mean, I know Jonathan and I, we talk about this all the time. I have five t-shirts. I think he has the same variation of a, a black V-neck that he wears every day. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, once I realized how simple it could be, I was like, oh, my life just right. got easy. I'll think about other stuff now. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you, you don't need that endless variety. So yeah, that's a great, great takeaway. And I, I wanted to shift gears for a second to food. I think this is what I would imagine is another fairly significant line item in the budget. So you said you spend about $28,000 a year. So that's about $77 a day. Mr. Noman, you said about a third of that is for living. So somewhere around $25 a day. So you're, you're at about $50 left, right? And obviously some of it would be that minimal transportation. You said $1,500 a year, but that's kind of a rounding error. 6%. Yeah. yeah. So talk us through what makes up the remaining $50 a day and how much of that is food, I guess. Yeah. So groceries is about 18% and then dining out is about 15%. So the two together, actually, it's more, we're spending more on food that we spend on accommodation because um, that's uh, actually it's 31%. So it's pretty close. But yeah, that's where we put on the budget uh, for food. Uh, we focus on our health and we look at travel as it's not like you're a two weeks vacation. So for us, we want it to be sustainable and we want to be fun. So we love cooking and we do go to the grocery store. We go to the, we love going to the local farmers markets and we cook our food at home. So that's 5,000 that has been through that budget expense in the first year. And then as regular people, even though we keep moving um, every other month, we also go out on weekends and try the local restaurants when we love the cuisine and all of that. Um, yeah, so that's also dining out. And you mentioned health in there. I think probably only in the U.S. do we freak out as much about health insurance, but I think it's probably worth talking about since you were here and now you're over there. What does it look like to take care of health insurance overseas? Uh, yeah, so, and I've moved to France, uh, sorry, I moved from France to the U.S., and I've got that nice health insurance from my tech company that was providing me with. And then during, I think for uh, on 
New Year's Eve, I was doing the dishes at home and I cut my finger pretty badly. So I went to go to the ER. Long story short, they just fixed my finger and it cost me like 5,000 bucks. And coming from a place when healthcare is free and in that situation, I would have paid nothing. I was pretty shocked. So um, I was kind of confident that being outside of the US, things would be better. And it turns out that has been the case. On our first year of travel, our healthcare has been actually pretty low because uh, my wife was still working. So we were basically covered for the, the first nine months. On year two, we did have to pay for global expat insurance. So that's much more for a catastrophic situation. And we're spending 3000 on that, 1200 for myself and 1800 for uh, my wife. Uh, but that's still, uh, again, catastrophic coverage, much better than what you would have to pay if you stay in the U.S. And we have been experiencing outside of the U.S. Um, last month when I was in, we were in uh, Malaysia and I have an ear infection. So I just went to see the doctor and I think he charged me 10 bucks just to look at my ear and confirm that it was a, a ear infection. And then she was prescribing me an antibiotic and some antifungal and she gave that to me on site and it was another 10 bucks. So 20 bucks out of pocket. I know the cost in France and all of that. So we are pretty fine. I mean, like if we spend a thousand bucks in a regular FCAR cost, I think that will be the max and that will be very unlucky. Right. So to be clear, the United States is, is, is singular in its ability to be both incredibly expensive for actual health care. So getting care, but also for health insurance. Both of those are pretty astronomical. Whereas overseas, you can have some sort of catastrophic insurance and you can cash flow everything for pennies on the dollar of what you would expect to pay here in the States. So it's just not, you know, financially life ending. Yeah, no, actually we are, I think we're not going to come back to the US, correct? That's our plan. Because yeah. we are just worried about, and it just doesn't make sense because if something happened to us in the US, then we have to pay that much on healthcare. And again, grew up in France. Um, unfortunately, my aunt. Um, she, so she passed away, but she was carrying like cancer for like 30 years and she was able to get treatment for a 30 years period. And she was able to, that was able to extend her life to a state when she was happy and only towards the end, things were a bit difficult, but I cannot imagine the same situation when you are unlucky. She was in her mid thirties when she started getting cancer. And then I cannot foresee how that can happen in the U.S. if you don't have millions of dollars in the bank, if you need uh, treatment for that period of time. So Cause I she paid zero dollars. Oh, yeah, sorry. Of course, I forgot to say that. But yeah, she didn't pay anything, of course, being under the French healthcare system. And, and the, other, the other piece of story, which is interesting, is that as we sign up for our global health pack insurance, they say, oh, do you want to add U.S. into the mix? And if you remove the U.S., basically, they will basically all of the treatment that we take out of the U.S., they will cut our deductible in half. Right. Um, so right. I, was, I was actually going to, I was actually going to bring Brad into this because I was saying, you guys were saying it was $3,000 for the year. So 1200 for one of you and $1,800 for the other of you anywhere in the world, except for the U S <laughs> of, of course, of course. Well, it covered, no, no, it, it covered the U S I think if I remove the U S it would be even cheaper. Okay. We, we covered the U S because we actually it's the U S and Japan and a few other countries that we are visiting. So we had to put that option, but uh, yeah, if you look it up online, you would see you get a greater discount when you don't have the U S. So let's talk about lifestyle. Obviously, you mentioned that health is important to you. I know that's a, a big aspect of what you do and also community. What does that look like as you travel the world? I mean, you guys are blazing this trail and there are other people out there listening to this who, who would love to do this, but they're wondering what does life look like? What is, is it possible to build community? Can you make friends? What does the day-to-day -day look like? I'd love for you guys to talk about that. Yeah, community is one of the biggest challenges, I'd say, about a nomadic lifestyle. That's one of the things we have to be a lot more proactive about than previously, where it sort of more naturally and organically happens when you stay and live in one place. But when you're moving around a lot, um, naturally you make friends and then you have to say goodbye. So that's definitely been a, a challenge for us, but something that we want to prioritize and make an effort at. So we've been reaching out to other nomadic people online, and so we meet people through different Facebook forums. We meet people through different expat groups. We make an effort to ev in every city that we go to to find an expat group like in Internations, which is um, which is this international sort of meetup type group for, for expats. Or we try to find hiking groups, things like that, where we get to actually meet people that are living there and make longer-term friends than people that are constantly moving. But that is something we're trying to 
constantly figure out and constantly trying to make work. Yeah, that has been an interesting learning for us um, because as you were saying, you know, it's very easy when you are in a specific location to build your community and have that community to stay pretty much with you. As you move very, very often, then that community doesn't stick. So it's easy to connect with travelers uh, or even expats, but then as you move, then those people doesn't follow along. And that's actually one of the reasons we're starting the blog is like, we wanted also a way to connect with like-minded people. And that actually attracted us some people like this as well. It's like, oh yeah, I, I like the nomadic lifestyle. I like what you guys are doing. And oh, I follow your journey. And by the way, I'm also going to travel. So we will also be able to meet people like this. But yeah, that's, I think it's probably the biggest challenge. Just keep in mind that community is going to be a challenge and that's something we're trying to adjust for the next five years. Uh, we are making tweaks to, to improve on that. In terms of health, I think Brad, you asked about that. Health, I think is probably our main priority. And now that we have all of that uh, time on us, we've been doing a lot of research, um, a lot of biohacking things. Like we try to, for instance, trying to reduce our addiction to device. So we do have a no tech Tuesday when every Tuesday the Wi-Fi is off, our phone stay in the apartment, and then we just go out and we do things on our own, which has been um, really good. And we also try to yeah reduce our exposure to EMF, reduce our exposure to any pollution. So as you travel, you might not think about things like you were taking for granted, like the quality of the water. Uh, we went to Mexico. You cannot drink from the tap. Here in Southeast Asia, it's the same thing. Um, so we are trying to see what's the best way for us to get clean water and uh, not only filtered water, because that's basically dead water, so you don't get all of the minerals. So there is a few things on that elf we can expand on that we've been looking into to yeah to stay as healthy as possible. I actually wanted to um, spend a few minutes kind of talking about what's next for you guys, but also kind of the future of the international community. So one of the things that you're doing, you know, by sharing your story, both on your website, but also by coming on this show is you're breaking down the barriers for additional people to join you on this journey, to have the courage to get started on their own. And as this grows and you see more and more people realizing they don't need to wait until they're 65 to go take that one cruise, to go finally see part of the world, but really just go do it. You can do it. Then really the key is then for those individuals to be able to connect. And I know our expat group or choose if I expat group has over 5,000 people in it from virtually every country imaginable. And you guys are now taking the charge here with your website and letting people know what you're doing. And people are now able to connect with you ahead of time. You say, Hey, we're going to be here next. You know, let's, let's connect while we're there. And maybe the friendships that were just limited to you being in a common zip code with someone are now really something that you can intentionally plan and plot ahead of time. What's next for you guys? So we've actually been giving it a ton of thought. I mean, with the new year and the new decade, we spend a lot of time thinking about, you know, the future and goals and resolutions and stuff. So we actually spent a lot of time thinking about what our 10-year vision is and what our five-year vision is. And we still want to have a nomadic life where we do a lot of travel, but we also plan on slowing down at some point. So we're thinking after five years of travelers, so we'd want a home base and that's largely because we do miss having a community and we do miss having a close knit group of people that we could see on a regular basis. So, yeah, so we think that in five years time, we might choose a place that we love out of all the countries that we've been to where we want to spend maybe half of the year there and base ourselves there. That way we can have more of a routine, you know, focus on the things that we care about, like our health and our passion projects and things like that, and then hopefully build a community there as well. And then we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we want to spend our free time in terms of our passions and projects. That's constantly a work in progress. I think it's probably a, a question that a lot of people on this spy journey ask themselves a lot. I know I ask myself that on a daily basis because suddenly you're you're working your your entire life and you think you're going to be working your entire life and you have like this clear identity, which was my title and where I worked, and suddenly that's gone. And you know, when people ask me what I do, I I say, oh, I'm I'm traveling, which is true and it's great and it's fulfilling for now. But I do want to have some greater passion and purpose that I'm working on. And that is going to be a work in progress that I figure out because I haven't asked myself that in the, the these past few decades that I've been studying and working. It's always been, you know, this is my career. This is my conventional lifestyle that I'm working towards and this is who I am. But now without that, who am I and what do we work on and what impact do we have? These are all questions that we're, we're asking ourselves and trying to figure out. It's a great problem to have. It's like, I feel privileged to be able to have time to think about this. Most people do not have the mind space and the energy to stop and think about what 
truly makes them happy and what their passion is because they're too busy at a job they're unhappy with. So I feel privileged to have this problem, but it's something that I'm going to have to do the work to to uncover. Yeah. And the I think the sky is the limit on there for... For me, I think the approach was a bit different. I was like, you know, again, I'm bringing France again, but it's like, like I, in France, you, you just work for a paycheck. It's like, I mean, you work for the money, but like when work is done, then you move on. So when I did not have to work, I say, oh, cool. Now I can just do what I like to do, which has been traveling since that's what my, you know, I like to do with my parents and I grew up and all of that stuff. And I was not more like, oh, I need to have a career. I need to have something amazing. So right now I'm more excited about like, more short term. So starting working on the blog, starting building the tool and um, learning a ton of new skill sets, you know, playing with our drone, taking videos and stuff. So it's like very learning exercise. And within two years now, we're thinking, oh, maybe we can start a nomad one on one class or like there's a lot of ideas that came up as we met people and run into problems because now we have a little bit of expertise and we can talk to people. Oh, yeah. If you start on that nomadic journey, those are the things you want to do. Those like we explained to you guys, you know, how we can reduce our spending, how what's the boundaries in terms of how much really you really need if you want to travel the world and all of those uh, concepts that we talk about with you guys. So for me, it's a slightly different approach. I'm not as focusing of finding something because I know it's going to come up uh, much more organically. Yeah, Mrs. Nomad, you use the word fulfilled in there. And, and I think this kind of gets at the human condition, right? Which is, what are we striving towards? What are we working towards? What are we here for, right? And, mm-hmm. and I'm curious, over these 18 months, have you thought about that? Are there days, are there weeks where you're like, what the heck am I doing? Like, are we just traveling? Are we working towards anything? Like, what are we doing? And, and I don't mean, I, I mean this more in the existential sense of like, this is what I would think. Like, I would love to travel, but I know there are days even now, you know, to your point about privilege, like my life is wonderful, but there are days even now where I wake up and I'm like, I'm just unhappy or I'm just having a bad day or I'm ha- like, what am I doing? Oh, grumble, grumble, you know, whatever. Has that come in with this sense of just kind of traveling? Is there a sense of maybe being lost in some regard or wanting something to work towards. Yeah, absolutely. I especially towards the beginning when I quit my job, I was asking myself that every day. I was basically waking up and be like, okay, what do I what do I do today? I mean, it's kind of overwhelming at first because your days are set for you basically your entire life. Like you um have to be somewhere or you have responsibilities, you have deadlines and things and all of a sudden that's gone. And that's a lot of time with basically you and your thoughts and and asking those questions, like you said, asking sort of those profound questions of like, what is my purpose? What is the impact I want to make on the world? I feel like in a way that this financial independence is a gift and it's a gift of time. And I feel in a way an obligation that I have to make good use of this time and that I have to be productive with this time or I have to give back with this time. And I've come to realize over time, though, that that is a pressure that I'm putting onto myself. And I get inspiration from Mr. Nomad because he has no, none of those hesitations at all. He's just like, I'm enjoying my day. I'm just like a puppy in a book. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. He's let's like, go. life is great. Why are you asking all these questions? <laughs> so I'm getting some balance from him for sure. And I've started to accept like, hey, it's, it's still fairly early on. It's only been a year and a half. Mm-hmm. I should give myself some time to just take a break and treat it as a few years of sabbatical. And I'm still like learning along the way. I'm still like doing a ton of personal develop- development stuff. Like I listen to a ton of podcasts, watch a ton of videos and stuff on to constantly build my skills. And you know, oh, yeah, yeah. We, are, we are not just drinking pina coladas and yeah. by the beach. We are just like, actually we spend our time. It's 50% like exploring, like you might expect, but the other 50% it's we are at work. We focus on those personal Work. development yeah. uh, or project. So yeah, we are not uh, being lazy or like not trying to make anything of our time. We know that we have that privilege and we are trying to, we just haven't find the big things yet. Yeah. There's just no like big North star anymore that we're moving towards, except to make sure that, you know, we're designing the life that makes us happy, which is great, but there isn't like this big fulfilling passion project that we're working on right now because we haven't found that yet, but I'm fairly confident that we'll, We'll, yeah, it's coming. We'll find yeah, something yeah, no, no. And that, <laughs> and <that's> li- <laughs> Brad, I have a feeling this conversation is going to be continued offline. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Well, we're excited for you now. Uh, 
Mr. Nomad, in terms of big projects, I know you do have an app that you're developing and I want to give you a chance to kind of tell the community a little bit about what you're working on. Why don't you uh, tell us what you've started to build? Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we were spending a ton of time. I was spending a ton of time in spreadsheet to track our expenses. And that's something we wanted to be on top of. So as a former engineer, I was like, you know, after doing the same thing three or four times, I was like, okay, I need to find a better system. Um, so I started just building an app in a couple of months to help ourselves first to track our budget across multiple currencies, as you might expect as we travel across different location. So yeah, so it's basically a travel tool right now for uh, that I put out, out there for anyone that want to use to track their expense, but not only track their expense, I want also people to discover what the true cost of living in the world is. So right now the app is sharing our cost of living in all the country we've been. So people can just take a look and see exactly how much it costs to live in those countries. And I'm looking for people to also do the same. If they see value in the app for them to track their expense, then the app will automatically crowdsource their data um, if they decide to opt in for everybody else as well. So we can build that database of cost of living around the world based on nomadic travelers. That sounds incredibly useful. We'll have a link for that in the show notes. All right, guys. Now in most episodes, that would be the end of the show. But on this episode, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Are you ready for this? Yeah, we are ready. In a world drowning in debt and rampant consumption, trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation, these questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat. All right, question number one. What is your favorite blog, podcast, or book of all time? Okay, so for me... Oh- for both, of us. for both of us, uh, it's going to be um, the Health Theory, which is a um, portion of the Impact Theory podcast from Tom Bilyeu. Um, we like that because we have been focusing on health now that we have all of the time and we want to keep traveling for as long as we want. And that podcast has been really good. We learn about gut health, we learn about sleep and a ton of topics. Yeah, if you like Health Theory with Tom Bilyeu, I don't know if you've heard of The Drive with Dr. Peter Atia but it will blow your mind. You need to listen. Brad to has been repping that podcast to me now, like almost on a daily basis. Yeah. And I still haven't listened. I'm going to go check it out as a result yeah. of this. This will be the final touch point. I'm going to go listen. Have you checked it out? Uh, I, I have it. I mean, it's just like the episodes are sometimes two or three hours long. And it's like, <laughs> no, maybe I'm like, not. I cannot like, it's too long, but uh, I've, yeah, it's pretty advanced stuff. So yeah, thanks. How <laughs> many again. hours a day do you have for self-development? <laughs> Come on now. He's at 30% of his time. Sure. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can do that. I hear you, brother. I hear you. <laughs> right, hey, um, question number two, an inflection point in your life that was especially memorable or meaningful. Okay, so moving to the U.S., I think that has been, yeah, a big inflection point for me. It was, again, as an engineer, it's like you move to the Silicon Valley. So it's like the big Eldorado for your job. But then I started discovering a beautiful country, a beautiful state, a different culture, um, mindset. So I grew a lot from there. And it was also giving me a different perspective from what I was, uh, I had in France and what I didn't have as well. It also based in California that I was discovering all of the financial independence concept and what you guys are doing. It's something that is really right now still emerging in Europe. So if I would have have moved there, I would have probably not thought about this. And this is also where I've met uh, my wife. So (laughs) (laughs) Um, we can can reprioritize those all in post. Don't worry about it. We got you. (laughs) Uh, But no, I was doing chronologically, but uh, yeah. So then, uh, (laughs) Well done, sir. Well done. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So um, yeah. So then, yeah, that's how we met. And then, yeah, two years after we met pretty much, we decided to take off. So since then it has been a wonderful journey and I'm looking forward for the many years of uh, travel exploration, whatever's coming next yeah i have a similar inflection point sort of experience where i moved abroad and worked from australia for three years so a similar idea where you know when you get out of your comfort zone and into a new country and you realize different values and different perspectives you just sort of realize what you truly value and you sort of adopt the best of both worlds which is which is a great experience all right question number three your favorite life hack well mine is now that we're traveling I, and I love to read, it's it's really hard to carry books around, but I love using the library apps. So the one that I use is called Libby. 
Um, and it basically allows you to check out books from the library. So we're still checking out books from the San Francisco library, even though we're not there and getting it sent Ooh. to us through Kindle. Wow. And so I have access to all the books, all the digital books at the San Francisco library directly sent to me in where, where I currently am in Malaysia. And mine was the travel rewards, because as we mentioned to you guys, we were able to like travel for almost nothing. And that has been like supercharging our um, our travel. So again, thanks for you guys, because that episode nine has been super resourceful. Absolutely. All right. Question number four, the biggest financial mistake that you've made. Okay. So I think right now we are still California residents, even though we are only planning on visiting the U.S. maybe a month, a year to see family. So we wish we would have changed residency before that. So we won't have to pay basically state tax for just a place that we won't be visiting um, more in the future. Mm. So that that is something we're going to try to fix this year, which is to get out of California residency because, yeah, that's something we didn't plan far enough in advance. And so we're having to pay a state, subsidi- state tax where we're not even residing in the in the state. Yeah. Well, so you've been outside of the U.S. for 18 months and you're still paying state tax to California? Yeah. Wow. Huge financial mistake. Oh, yeah, because crazy. from California, we don't have any euros or residency right now. So it's like, yeah, you just like send us your tax. So, yeah. That's the, the tax laws just aren't up to speed with modern lifestyles and nomadic lifestyles. So there's no way for us to convey to them that we're not living elsewhere without having a residency. A different or- residency. You can convey yeah, by else. sending them yeah. that check each year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be clear on that, though, you're paying state tax on income. Are you still bringing in income at one of you? One it's of you? on dividends and interest. Dividends and interest. All yeah. Right. Let me go ahead and ask question number five, other than maybe like taking care of your residency status before you uh, roll off on this grand adventure. <laughs> the advice you would give your younger self. So yeah, everything happened for a reason, whether it's good or bad. So for instance, when I went to the US, I have no idea I was going to live that lifestyle of being financially, having the chance of being financially free or traveling the world. I moved to the US because I was excited by the opportunity to work in Silicon Valley and work with all of those bright people. And then from there, the next step happened as well. It's not until like I never planned from the beginning the life that we are going to have today. So that's why for me, like when we are mentioning, like having that big vision of like that big um, career impact for me, I know it's going to happen. It's just like, you just follow your intuition and your gut feeling. So everything that happens in your life for you is like, I believe in for those things to happen for, um, for a reason. And don't try to understand too much what's happening when things are not turning the way they think, because ultimately it's going to be good. Yeah. I think it's really hard to join the dots, you know, ahead of time to have this master plan where everything's going to be, but it, but it's really easy to see the pattern afterwards. And so in that case, it's really to open yourself up to as many opportunities as possible and see what happens. Mrs. Nomad, what about you? Um, I would have to agree with them on, on that one. When we were discussing this, I was like, oh, you, you could kind of stole mine. I basically don't want to change a thing. Even if I could give advice to my younger self, I wouldn't want to give advice that might change anything the course of my path or the course of my life, because I'm essentially living my dream lifestyle now and my dream life now. So I wouldn't want to change anything that would alter that. That's great. All right. We've got a bonus question for you here. What is the purchase you've made in, let's say the last 12 months or so that has added the most value to your life? Yeah. So we'd have to say we've added to our carry-on list, basically a travel zero waste kit, because we found when we were initially traveling, we were using a ton of plastic and having a ton of waste because as you travel, you're just, you're just on the go so much and you don't always have everything that you need at a specific time. So just being prepared with reusable produce bags, Tupperware, reusable straw, we have cutlery, a handkerchief. We might add to that list, but we, we've collected a few items throughout our travels that we found really useful to reduce our footprint. Yeah. And those have been the ones we've been using. We use them every day. So those are like must keep items to our travel list. Everything we don't use for a few weeks, we usually discard them because it's not as valuable as we need for us. Awesome. Well, this has been great. I mean, I really, you've kind of given us a roadmap to help us think through how we might put together our own journey. And we're, we're grateful. Someone's listening to this. They want to find out more. They want us, they want to find out with a couple that only owns 106 items. What are those items? (laughs) They want to find out where you're going next or connect with you in another country. What is the best way for someone to do that? Yeah, so I think the best way for uh, your audience to connect with us is to uh, visit our blog, nomadnumbers.com, and then sign up for our newsletter. We put a lot of great content there for people to get started 
Mr. and Mrs. Nomad, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Yeah, thank you guys so much for the opportunity. Thank you. All right, I hope you got value from today's episode. I mean, we, we, we really, as we were putting this together, tried to think about what, if you're an aspiring nomad, what do you need to be thinking through? And I think Mr. and Mrs. Nomad did a fantastic job just kind of putting together a framework for working through this. I hope you'll go check out their site and I'm sure you'll get a lot of value out of it. You know, we referenced in that episode several times, travel rewards. I mean, we didn't even really have to talk about the travel costs because you can travel for almost free if you understand how travel rewards work. We reference episode nine of our show in this, in this episode, definitely go listen to that as a solid framework. And if you want to get the most up-to-date information, we've actually put together a free travel course for you, which you can find at chooseify.com slash travel. It actually walks you through all the latest, most up-to-date information and gives you granular steps to take action on putting your first travel rewards journey together, whether it be to go to a family wedding in another state or travel around the world. The doors of travel will open up to you with this course. Just go to chooseify.com slash travel. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less travel. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.